Um, so I'm very, very honored to welcome Neil today to South Park Commons. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, South Park Commons is a community of technologists and tinkerers, and we get together to explore ideas we're passionate about and discover what we want to be working on. Um, so, Neil, I was looking through your bio, and I was trying to find... Oh, in fact, I was trying to count how many things you're affiliated with. <laughs> so I first started with all your university affiliations. And for those of you who don't know, he is actively affiliated with, let's start from Europe, um, I would say Cambridge, Oxford, Harvard, Stanford, and even the Singhao University in Beijing, which is incredibly impressive. And I was like, is there a single institution um, that you would want to be affiliated with and you're no longer, you're not yet affiliated with? Well, I think some of those affiliations don't qualify as active. I'm not sure any academic affiliation is really active. But my, my main job is at Stanford at the Hoover Institution now. I still have a fellowship at Harvard at the Center of European Studies. I actually teach, when I do teach, uh, at Tsinghua in Beijing. Uh, because I'm a professor, visiting professor there. Uh, but Oxford and Cambridge, that's all in the dim and distant past. So it's not quite as crazy as Wikipedia makes it sound. <laughs> I haven't got around to correcting the Wikipedia entry. Don't even do it. No, it's so it's, fascinating. It's too depressing. To, I can't even bear to read it. Um, okay, and then the other amazing thing is all the awards you've received, but there is no way I could go through that impressive list of awards. Tell them about the International Emmy. That's the one I'm proudest of. <laughs> yes. He <laughs> is also a film. Cool. He also makes film, and he won an International Emmy. Do you want to tell us a bit about it? Well, that was the television series, The Ascent of Money, which was done for PBS and uh, was awarded an Emmy. Other people may know the book better because the book also did quite well. That was 10 years ago, uh, and it all came out around the time that the financial crisis was kicking off. And by and large, that's the thing I'm best known for. Uh, but the fact that I won an Emmy was a source of great delight to me because not many academics do that. And it annoyed my colleagues intensely. So <laughs> has it been conclusively agreed upon that you did predict the financial crisis? Well, I, I, I can claim that I did, actually, because I was writing... Uh, newspaper articles uh, and some more academic stuff from late 2006 through 2007 uh, pointing out where, why it was that subprime mortgages were going to trigger this chain reaction. Uh, but I was writing in, in the, the Sunday Telegraph, I think it was in, in London, uh, and, and that got carried by the LA Times, which means that nobody actually read it, at least as far as I could see. Um, and, and that means that it, the there's, uh, there's not quite the same celebrity attached to those predictions as, as got attached to, say, Nouriel Roubini's. Uh, we were actually colleagues at NYU before the financial crisis, and Nouriel was always predicting there would be a disaster. He predicted it every year throughout the time I knew him, starting in 2002. <laughs> those of you who are actually in financial markets will know that that's not a particularly uh, good strategy. It's certainly a terrible strategy for making money. Uh, the key was to get the timing right and, and, and then to get the nature of the crisis right. And Nouriel thought there was going to be this great dollar crisis because of the current account deficit, which was exactly what didn't happen because the dollar actually strengthened during the crisis. And my story was much more, hey, this is a, an enormously uh, uh, unstable edifice that's been built on top of, of U.S. mortgages. And if those turn out to be wrongly rated in the structured products then the banks are totally undercapitalized. That was what happened. And the reason that I can you know, reasonably, credibly claim to have predicted it uh, is that the book, The Ascent of Money, said all that. And it came out before Lehman Brothers went bust. And it took about two years to write. OK, so this leads me to my next obvious question. Um, my brother-in-law, who's in Wall Street, is predicting a financial crisis every year. Um, since the last two years, and especially a tech financial crisis. Mm. Um, so what would your prediction be, um, both for a financial crisis, but also a tech financial crisis? Well, financial crises um, are quite frequent, but really big ones are relatively rare. 2008-9 uh, was remarkable because there really hadn't been anything on that scale 
perhaps since 1929-31, uh, even the, the nasties of the 1970s weren't quite as, as dramatic or as global. Uh, what we've seen in the last six months or so has been a limited emerging market crisis in places like Argentina and Turkey. But that doesn't really get you, you know, into, into the big stakes. Tech is different. People who, who spend time here, you're all much too young by the looks of you to remember the dot-com bubble. But you periodically, you'll meet people who say, oh, it's another dot-com bubble. And, and that, that's not right. I think the big issue in, in tech is, is not really financial. The issue is, is there going to be a big regulatory change uh, which will play havoc with the business models of companies like Facebook and Google? And I think the answer to that is yes, that's coming. Uh, and the aftermath, the, the legacy of 2016, is going to ultimately be costly for those companies. That's something I wrote about in, the, in this book, The Square and the Tower, that I thought I might chat a bit about tonight. So I'll save my question for the end of the talk, but my question was going to be, do you think it would impact them negatively or consolidate their position in the market, hmm. given that usually new regulation l tends to lead to fewer upstarts. But yeah. we can save that. No, that is a gr that's the right question to ask. And in fact, I've just been finishing a paper which I've given the grandiose title, What is to be done? Uh, addressing that issue, showing that it depends what road the US Congress goes down, if any. I, I don't think the status quo is sustainable, so something has to be done. But if it goes down the road of empowering federal regulators, giving them more power over, uh, over the tech sector, then I think your prediction or your implied prediction will be right and the incumbents will just capture the regulators and make sure that the regulations serve the incumbents. I think Mark Warner, who's just published this 20-point paper on what should be done in regulation, doesn't appear to see that or if he sees it, uh, he doesn't acknowledge it. There are other things that can be done, though, which I think would not lead to that outcome. And my, you know, my white, my white paper, my paper argues uh, for an alternative approach. I don't think we should regulate these companies like utilities. I don't even believe in the antitrust idea of breaking them up. But there are other things we can do. Maybe we can get to talk about them. Sounds great. So um, Neil and I actually met over a dinner where the topic of conversation, not so unsurprisingly was Bitcoin. Um, given is it always? <laughs> it was at Sam Lessons. It's always the topic if of If you had Sam Lessons, yeah. it's always the topic of conversation. I was there last dinner. night. Oh, yeah. I was, you, where were you? I, guess what I we were chose talking, to guess opt what out. We were talking about. Bitcoin. <laughs> Got it in one. Um, if you could sum up your sentiment on um, Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, it would be useful just so that we could lay the groundwork for questions at the end of the talk. Any crypto people here? Okay, <laughs> good to know. Um, Bitcoin was uh, invented or at least unveiled at around the same time the Ascent of Money was written. So it's not in the Ascent of Money. Uh, I took some time to understand its implications when my then, I think he was 13 or 14 year old son, said you really need to get interested in Bitcoin. I was dismissive. That was, I think, 2013 or 2014. And uh, it was a kind of dismissiveness that people of my age with academic positions are really tempted to engage in. Uh, it wasn't quite as bad as, ha, huh, it's tulip mania, which was the kind of uh, imbecile, uninformed response of last year. Uh, but my, my response then was, Look, the history of money is that the state tries to monopolize money, and if there's a threat to that monopoly, it tends to clamp down pretty hard. So uh, don't get excited. At some point, they'll shut this down. That was a, that was a, a naive and ill-informed uh, reading. I should have listened to him. Um, and I spent a lot of, of, of time subsequently educating myself. And here's where I am. Bitcoin has already established itself, I think, successfully as an option on digital gold. In other words, if it turns out to work as a, a store of value, or perhaps better, an asset class, which every millionaire in the world should have in his or her portfolio, 
to some extent, then the current prices on the low side could be quite low. We're not quite sure that this works, so that's why I call it an option. Uh, but I think that you'd need to have massive international coordination to shut it down completely, and that was a point that I missed when I was uh, less well informed. As long as there are you know, a couple of major economies that haven't completely prohibited it, then, then the game is still on. I think, th therefore, uh, Bitcoin has succeeded in at least one respect as a financial innovation. Uh, I don't think it's succeeded as money, uh, and I, I think it will be very hard for it to succeed as money. By and large, I think it's difficult for any blockchain-based currency to succeed as, as money for reasons that, that have to do with the difficulty of, of bootstrapping uh, and becoming part of a, a relatively smoothly functioning fiat system. I mean, if you think of the, the highest stakes scenario, one in which you successfully replace the 1970s post-Bretton Woods dollar-based international monetary system, I mean, that, that's the kind of massive revolution. It's really hard to see how that would happen. Uh, because A, that system is working pretty well. Um, the problems of, of, of inflation that seemed so serious in the 1970s have receded and almost been replaced by a problem of deflation. And there's a new payment system evolving out of China, which is AI-based and platform-based uh, and doesn't need blockchain. And that could be the real rival of the dollar-based system. Now, as long as those two currency systems are functioning as, as, uh, as monetary systems, which they both seem to, there isn't really a need to reinvent money. So the use case uh, for blockchain or the use cases will, I, I think, turn out to be different from what was originally offered, which was a, a kind of money without third party verification. I don't think that's what's going to emerge. And I'll just say one more thing, which harks back to the essence of money. It, this is an evolutionary process. Financial history is authentically evolutionary. And often the, the use case for a financial innovation doesn't become apparent initially. Uh, the very idea of a joint stock company or of equity finance uh, really originated with an attempt to solve the fiscal problems of 17th and 18th century European states. Nobody sat down and said, hey, I have a great idea for how we can finance uh, industrial corporations. It turned out to work for that, but only you know, quite a long time after the innovation. So I, I'm thinking about blockchain that way that there probably are use cases, and the experimentation that's going on here and elsewhere is really interesting and exciting. There's been an awful lot of phony stuff. Uh, there's going to be a funny book to be written about uh, dodgy white papers in the ICO uh, mania. Uh, but it's not all nonsense. And when, to revert to my old friend at NYU, Nouriel Rabini, when Nouriel's inveighing in this very vehement way against uh, what he calls shitcoin, my immediate response is, you know, you're, you're, you're just grandstanding here. That this, this can't be right. There's clearly something going on here, um, and something, I think, enduring will emerge that will have a significant uh, contribution to the, the new financial system of the 21st century. Okay, so with that answer, I am going to introduce Neil's talk. I actually sent this in an email uh, when I was reminding everyone of this talk because we had it scheduled a while ago. And um, oh, here in Silicon Valley, I feel that we misunderstand the concept of time and the concept of history. Even things one year ago seem so, so old and so archaic. Um, and as a result, we fail to learn lessons from historical events and how to apply them um, in Silicon Valley. And what I find so fascinating about Neil is he can condense macroeconomic trends over 300 years and apply it um, in today's context and make it relevant for technologists like us. So I think it's a very unique opportunity um, to hear his thoughts um, on technology, on Silicon Valley, in context um, to all this knowledge that he has and all this historical context that he has, um, and just get a different point of view and a different perspective. 
Um, so with that, I am going to let you walk us through your presentation. Well, I, I almost don't feel like doing it, to be honest. Um, <laughs> because I think it might be more up. fun to have a conversation. So what I'll do is I'll rattle through a few slides that just sketch the arguments of the book and offer what will probably be a rather unfamiliar analogy to you. And this can just cue up our conversation. I dread lectures. Uh, I don't really believe in lecturing. So treat this as just a kind of introduction to the conversation that we're going to have. Uh, some of it's going to be really obvious to you. Uh, the, the proposition that uh, I think you grew up with and, and, and was introduced to me beginning in the 1990s was that if we had a, a hyper-connected world, then everything would be awesome. And this was expressed in various different ways. It became one of the major propaganda slogans of Facebook, that this was going to be a global community. And once you had a global community, you could solve all the problems in the world, poverty, climate change, cancer, you name it. Uh, and it turned out that uh, an, a networked world wasn't entirely awesome. Uh, at least there were a lot of things that came out of the networked world that certainly people in Silicon Valley weren't expecting and didn't, by and large, like. So 2016 was, I think, a little bit like the financial crisis of 2008. It was Silicon Valley's equivalent. And the book, The Square and the Tower, is really the ascent of money comes to Silicon Valley. I arrived, uh, and I realized the state of mind uh, pre-election was like the Wall Street state of mind before the financial crisis. They didn't see what was coming. And one of the advantages of being an historian is that you actually have a better sense of the scenarios that may come along. You're, you're trained, as the great R.G. Collingwood once put it, to be uh, like one of those woodsmen who's wandered through the woods enough to spot the tiger in the grass that the unwary traveler doesn't see. Everybody in... Uh, the valley that I met around the time I moved to Stanford pre the November 2016 election was blissfully unaware of the trouble that they were getting into. Uh, and I just remember thinking, it's that same state of mind I'd encounter in Wall Street, even in 2007, when it was clear that the wheels were coming off. The attitude was, it couldn't possibly happen to us because we're so smart. So 2016 uh, needs to be explained. And what the square in the tower tries to do is to show that it was perfectly predictable from both network science and history that having a hyper-connected world with 3.57 degrees of separation rather than 6 wouldn't be awesome, but in fact would be, for one thing, highly polarized. Homophily in networks and social networks is something that sociologists have been writing about since the 1970s when they were trying to figure out why school integration was failing in American <coughs> high schools. Uh, and this is just an illustration of uh, the homophily story writ large uh, when you create a, an enormous social network like uh, Twitter. Uh, I like this paper by Brady, which came out last year. Uh, showing that people basically retweet in these two quite distinct clusters uh, in political content. You retweet within a, either a conservative cluster or a liberal cluster, and you can see that there's really not much crossover retweeting. And uh, the other nice thing that this illustrates is the way that network platforms are designed uh, intentionally to exacerbate polarization. Because for every emotive word that you use in a tweet, every one emotive word, it's 20% more likely to get retweeted, which is why people seem to be so mad all the time on, on Twitter. That, that stuff really works. The other thing that we've learned, but it wasn't really news, uh, was the way in which not just extreme views, but fake news transmits and can be transmitted very rapidly. This is one of Kate Starbird's recent... Uh, network graphs, which reveals, amongst other things, that liberals were more likely to retweet Russian content than conservatives were, kind of surprising uh, insight. There are, there are a bunch of other insights from network science that, that I could uh, share with you, but 
you probably know them, and I want to get to the history. Because of the way that the network platforms have been engineered in order to engage you, and because of the way that network science operates, we now find ourselves in this extraordinary culture war. And if you aren't aware that you're in a culture war, uh, that, that, that's kind of worrying. Uh, if you're on a university campus, you know you're in the culture war. And you know it kind of looks like this. Unlike the civil war, where there were two sides and one issue, in the culture war that is currently raging on the internet, there are multiple sides and multiple issues. Uh, and this is, uh, to many people, deeply troubling. If you're a public intellectual, that's what I found myself being called. I always think of a public convenience when I hear the phrase public intellectual. It's not a particularly uh, admirable thing, it seems to me, but it's what I'm called. It just means that you're a professor who writes op-ed and appears on television. This activity of being publicly engaged has become really, really unpleasant and indeed dangerous, at least to your reputation, because the culture war uh, is waged not through argument, uh, I remember the days of argument, but that's not what happens anymore. It's, it's waged through character assassination uh, and reputational destruction. Uh, so you're asking yourself, well, you know, wow, that's not, that's not the interconnected world we were promised. What happened to the global community that Zuck was talking about at the Harvard commencement not so long ago? Well, here's where the history comes in and I think is really helpful. The only analogy that really works when you're asking yourself about the impact of the internet is the impact of the printing press. And the reason that it works is illustrated very well in this paper that a guy uh, in London named Dittmar published a few years ago. And it just shows rather beautifully how the impact of printing uh, is similar to the impact of the personal computer and, and the internet in terms of price, unit price, and in terms of, of the, the volume of books and personal computers. Uh, nothing quite like that happened in any of the intervening uh, centuries. And this is a really important analogy to think about because it helps us understand our own world. All the analogies that you tend to come across in the New York Times, the Washington Post, uh, oh, it's the 1930s all over again, are really unilluminating. Because our world is nothing like the 1930s one. The 1930s, the technology of communication was centrally controlled, more or less, for uh, And it was possible for a central government to completely control the communication system. Uh, that's not the world that we've lived through. We've lived through a time where a distributed network system was made possible by new technology, and central control, uh, at least for a time, was very difficult indeed. Uh, there's a rather alarming implication uh, that follows from that. Just as Martin Luther was wrong to think that the printing press would allow the priesthood of all believers to come into existence, he, he was a utopian. He thought that if everybody could read the Bible in their own language in a printed copy, the world would be a better place. What actually happened was 130 years of religious conflict in Europe, uh, which, as this uh, illustration reminds us, was extremely bloody. Uh, and, and the point that the book makes is we should not be surprised to find ourselves in this culture war, because although it's not in our part of the world religious, it's of course religious in other parts of the world, uh, it's sort of secular religions that are at war with one another at the moment. Uh, you know, it's a quasi-religious notion that there must be multiple genders and you have to persecute people who don't use the right pronoun. This is just the kind of thing that people did in the 16th and 17th century uh, when they were arguing about consubstantiation and transubstantiation. So I think we need to understand our time as comparable with the time after 1517 when the Reformation divided uh, Western Europe. Uh, and it's the same phenomenon. Clustering. Some people agreed with Luther. They formed the Protestant cl uh, cluster. And some people violently disagreed, thought he should be burned to the stake, and that was the Counter-Reformation. 
trust them. If they'd had Twitter, they'd have been using it to, uh, to accuse one another of, of heresy. Extreme views and fake news. Uh, in the Reformation, the idea that there are witches uh, is an idea that becomes almost as popular as the idea uh, that we should have justification by faith alone. And, and women get burnt uh, or otherwise killed uh, because of this belief in witchcraft, which spreads through the printing press as readily as any of Luther's ideas. I'm nearly done. The, this collapse of, of, of confidence in institutions, which one of, is one of the many symptoms uh, of our crisis, uh, begs the question, what the hell can we do? I mean, if one looks at uh, the reputational crises that are afflicting some companies, uh, you know, how often do you trust each of the following companies to do the right thing in front of the companies here? Uh, you know, Amazon gets sort of 53% some of the time or never. Google's about the same. Uber's 69%. Facebook's 71%. Twitter's about the same. The president's on 75% some of the time, never. Congress is on 79%. Wall Street wins. Uh, people still don't trust Wall Street at all. And if you're you know, working at Uber or Facebook, they should console you. Uh, so this is a time when uh, established institutions and even newly established institutions are struggling to maintain their legitimacy. The argument I want to conclude with is the analogy with the end of the wars of religion. I mean, we can't go on like this. This is just crazy. This country is becoming increasingly polarized, and you begin to wonder if it is actually going to turn from verbal violence into actual violence when people are sending pipe bombs through the mail, which are the prison personal people uh, are responsible for that. So what can we learn from the wars of religion, which followed the introduction of the printing press and the transformation of communications in Europe? I think there are a few important things that we can learn, but the most important is um, that it did come to an end. And the Peace of Westphalia in 1648, and this is a, a picture of that event, uh, drew a line underneath the conflict and set Europe on, on a path that ultimately led via the scientific revolution and the Enlightenment to a generally better equilibrium. What would our equivalent of a Peace of Westphalia look like? Well, this is what I mentioned earlier, talking to Richard, I've been thinking a lot about. What do we actually have to do to stabilize the internet world? And I, I'm going to bring this up more in discussion, but let me offer you a brief synopsis of this new paper. Um, I, I think the idea that you can sort of fix this by breaking up big network platforms is, is not going to fly. Um, I won't go into the detail of why we can talk about it in the discussion. I think the idea of regulating them as utilities, whether as railroads or some other utility, is a kind of depressing solution to the problem too. Uh, but I have a few concrete recommendations, uh, two of which are really about the domestic impact of, uh, of regulation, and one of which is international, and that's the most Westphalian part of the argument. So the first part of what we need to do is we have to get rid of Section 230, uh, the thing that gives the network platforms an exemption uh, from liability for the content that they, uh, that they host. That's a total anachronism. It date back, dates back to a time when those companies were as big as your companies, and it's nuts that the biggest corporations in the world have this exemption. Uh, uh, I think the, the advantage of going down this road, by the way, over going down the regulation or antitrust road, is that you essentially open these companies up to the kind of litigation that might really incentivize them uh, to do uh, a better job rather than pretending to, to do curation by saying, oh, we're hiring 20,000 people to moderate all the content on the internet, which if, if you believe that, you really are ready to buy a bridge from me. But there's a corollary of getting rid of Section 230, and that is you have to follow on from the observation, this is now the public sphere. Uh, the, the network platforms really are the public sphere now, and therefore the First Amendment has to apply. Uh, they can't engage in censorship uh, in the name of their community standards. Uh, that gives them far too much power. So they need to be liable for the content 
And if content appears that is uh, authentically uh, harmful uh, to users or indeed non-users, then they should be liable in the courts for that. But they also can't engage in arbitrary censorship, the sort that I think they're increasingly inclined to do. That doesn't solve the problem of cyber war, though, which is a very real problem. Uh, and the only way you can solve that, because deterrence doesn't work, is through cyber war state. There needs to be an understanding of convention signed by the permanent members of the UN Security Council to cease engaging in cyber warfare as they cease engaging in chemical and biological warfare. That would be the piece of Westphalia in cyberspace. Uh, of course, the reason I remember the, mentioned the permanent members of the Security Council is that that includes Russia uh, and the China, but also the United States, which doesn't exactly desist from cyber warfare. I've spent a long time working on this, on this what is to be done paper. Uh, it really is an attempt to answer the questions that the Square in the Tower raises. Uh, the Square in the Tower sh- says, we're basically rerunning the 16th and 17th century. That's what we're in the midst of. That's why the culture war is so kind of out of control. But the paper, what is to be done, says, here are some things we can do that could possibly bring an end to this culture war. And a final point. The good news? which I didn't mention, uh, is that everything today happens an order of magnitude faster than it did then. So what took 130 years, 130 years of religious conflict, uh, will be all over in 30 years if we get this right. And instead of having the 30 years war, we'll just have the three years war. Um, I guess that's not entirely good news, but, but it sure seems better than completely rerunning. The 16th and 17th centuries. And with that, I will shut up, sit down, and we can have a discussion. We will prompt. Thank you. So I'm coming this from, I think, an interesting, well, so I first started reading you when I was concerned with this question of historiosity, and then you had edited a series of essays on counterfactualism. And this was when you were writing quite a lot about um, radicalism and the kind of the failed European multiculturalism project. Um, where I fell on a very different side <laughs> of, of the spectrum than I think where you came from. Um, and, but having recently read this book and kind of thought about your ideas of counterfactualism and how one can create narrative structures that are applicable to how we then solve current problems today. Um, I, I had a really great question and it just sort of escaped me and then I just set the scene for... Okay, it's, that's, I'm glad we're, we're aligned on that. Um, I, think, I think it's just some of the th- ideas that you had, I think, especially in the early 2000s, um, especially around the, your propositions around imposing the First Amendment obligations, seem to be mm, a little bit of a deviation from your ideas on private companies and how um, the basic economic structure and what what government's role was kind of, yeah, so. In the end, the the problem that we confront is uh, the the natural monopolies that network uh, economics produces. You know, they don't lend themselves to the standard oil solution. I mean, I suppose you could break up Amazon, you could break up. Uh, basically just by taking the, the separate business of off and take Instagram away. But you would still r- remain uh, confronted by very, very large networks. And even if Facebook was just a free standard company, it would still be fast. Even if you broke up Alphabet, Google would still be this fast dominant searcher. And I think the key here is that standard data is different from standard oil. It becomes the public sphere. Uh, and there comes a point when you say, hang on, we can't have the public sphere entirely dominated by a handful of private companies whose, whose utility function is to sell ads by maximizing user engagement. Because with that as their business model, there are incentives for fake news and extreme views to circulate, and we've created an engine for polarization. We've created a system for dividing the public sphere. So I think it's at that point that you have to ask yourself, 
what is an appropriate regulatory framework for such a world. This never happened with the printing press. And this is a point I make in the book. The great thing about printing blockchain fans is it stayed completely distributed. Uh, even although there were various press barons like you know, William Randolph Hearst and Rupert Murdoch and Artan who tried to centralize the press, they totally failed by the standard <coughs> of Silicon Valley. I mean, their market shares globally were negligibly small. Uh, so the, the truth about printing is that it remained a highly decentralized technology to the present day. And uh, that's part of the, the charm of it. I, I write books. I'm really so old school. That's basically what I do. I'm using, I'm using 15th century technology to disseminate my ideas. Um, and I, I still have that sense that um, I am a, a relatively autonomous node uh, in that community of people who, who write for a living. Uh, imagine a world in which libraries had funded themselves by selling ads so that when you went to the library uh, and picked up a book, you had a whole bunch of ads coming out. Now, I grew up in public libraries in Scotland. That's where I kind of lived. It was raining all the time and TV sucked, so I just read books. And that world of free books uh, is a, one of the really interesting features of the public sphere from the 1500s onwards. You know, just free books, uh, it's a great and amazing idea. We don't, in our public sphere, have this distributed network anymore. Tim Berners Lee thought it was going to be a distributed network. That was the whole idea of the World Wide Web. And then, boom, network platforms come along and they just monopolize one segment after another. So that's why, as somebody who's usually represented as a conservative, I'm really just a classical liberal, but these days on the campus, you're called conservative. As a classical liberal, I confront that problem. I say, what do we do? But we don't want to say, hey, regulators, Come and do the great job you've been doing in the financial sector to technology. Um, hey, let's let's learn the lessons of the railroads and apply them to the internet. I mean, if there's one thing economic history tells you, it's don't do that. <laughs> so I spent a lot of time in the last year thinking, well, in that case, if we want to avoid that, and we can't really break these network platforms up because of network economics, what do we do? So the idea is use the law courts and the individual citizens to simultaneously constrain them, but also oblige them to be the authentic marketplace for ideas that they should be. Um, okay, Yev. Yev is our youngest member. He's a high school student. Yes. Sure uh, so I'm young and optimistic. I want to figure out what can we, what can I do, what can we do here? So you, the, uh, the solution you provide, it involves a lot of what Congress or acting officials would do. Uh, after the Cambridge Analytica scandal came out, there was all these things of like, who can make the new decentralized Facebook? We'll give you 100K to fund your big thing. Like, we'll get, you, we'll get you all the resources. Is there, so based off your knowledge and your understanding of the situation, do you believe there is like this company waiting to be started, this new cryptocurrency, this new blockchain waiting to be started that could effectively help us get closer to this solution or is the solution to this uh, topic of the culture war, all the large companies, is the only solution really coming down to the regulations and the consequences these companies face from the free, from the speech on their platforms? Uh, I share your optimism. You'll be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> because one, one important oversimplification here, uh, I mean, all slide decks simplify, uh, but when you look at the history of, of what happened in the 17th century, it's not like somebody blows a whistle in 1648 and says, right, stop the religious war, we're having the peace of Westphalia, and then we're going to have the scientific revolution. Ready, everybody? <laughs> Go. That's not how history works. Uh, Keith Thomas wrote a wonderful book, Religion and the Decline of Magic, showing that gradually, socially and culturally, in England, people stopped believing in witches and started doing science. And this was a gradual process. Uh, it happened in the realm of of, of the intellectuals, but it also happened in, in ordinary people's lives. So that by the end of the 17th century, it really was regarded as kind of weird to think that witches lived amongst us. And it was regarded as normal to think that by observation, you might be able to understand the natural world. So I think that's really encouraging, because it means that at some point, 
people will be so revolted by the excesses of polarization and the culture war, uh, the populist politics, that they will move on. I think they are moving on. I just read a, a very interesting uh, study uh, of American society, Hidden Tribes, which you may possibly have come across. If you delve into the data on Hidden Tribes, it, it shows you the extent of disillusionment amongst what they call the exhausted middle with the craziness that's going on in the extremes. We have our own version of this on the Stanford campus. And there's this exhausted middle of people that just really don't get what the far left or the far right are doing. So what does a, a, a young member of the exhausted middle who wants the culture war to stop and is alienated by what has been going on on Facebook and Twitter do? I'm looking at a lot of interesting companies that are coming up with ideas uh, for using blockchain to solve this problem. And I'll give one example, a company uh, which essentially is trying, I won't name it, is, is trying to use blockchain so that content uh, can simply be paid for in more efficient ways uh, using tokens. Subscriptions, paywalls are extraordinarily unpopular. I write a weekly column. It appears in the Sunday Times in London, the Boston Globe here. And every week I have to put up with abuse on Twitter from people who just regard it as wrong that my stuff isn't free. And of course, you know, I'm supposed presumably to feed my children uh, on, on water and bread and write for free for the benefit of Twitter users. But I can see why paywalls are annoying. Not because things should be free, but who the hell wants to type their credit card details into a cell phone? It's just the most annoying way of paying for anything ever invented. There may be a solution that makes content much easier to pay for without going through a network platform at all. And I, that's the kind of solution that interests me if we're no longer going to our content via Facebook or Google, then we're no longer going to be subject to those algorithms that say, if you're interested in vegetarianism, you'll be really interested in veganism. Mm -hmm. you know, if you're interested in Donald Trump, you'll be really interested in Hitler. Those algorithms that kind of send <laughs> us out onto the cultural periphery are the problem. Uh, and there, there are surely ways that we can use technology to liberate at least the, the thinking members of society from, from those from those algorithms. So I hope we're going to do it. I'm counting on you. Because <laughs> yeah, I'm too old. <laughs> All right, Trisha, you're next. So I'm curious as to why you crossed off regulation as utilities and I mean, it's clear that you're not a huge fan of regulation, but regulation can also lead to a lot of tech companies to start. Like a bunch of companies in South by Common itself who are in the rec tech space and helping companies comply with regulation. So it's not necessarily a very um, dual, like, oh, it's just com completely stop innovation. So I'll slide deck simplify. In the, the paper, I go through all the current proposals that are out there uh, for changing the regulatory framework. And if you take Mark Warner's new white paper, which is 20 separate proposals, about half of them involve creating new duties, obligations for tech companies that imply new powers for regulators. Otherwise, who's enforcing them? And the question that I ask, and it goes to something said earlier, which is, well, why should we believe that empowering the FTC or the FCC will have any more benign outcomes than all the powers that were given to regulators uh, in the financial sector uh, prior to 2008. A great myth about the financial crisis is that it was caused by deregulation. It's a complete myth. There was a ton of regulation, uh, particularly for banks. Banks were the most regulated entities in the financial sector. It's just that the regulations were completely abused. Uh, the regulators had in some measure been captured. Uh, and why shouldn't that happen again? The lesson of history going all the way back to the 19th century is that uh, the corporate America uh, is very good at regulatory capture, but Washington DC is where that happens. Mm -hmm. And therefore I'm skeptical about the idea that we're going to solve the problem just by empowering one or other federal 
regulate it, it seems quite likely that the unintended consequence will be to entrench the incumbents and make it harder for you with your startup that's going to solve the problem to get there. Uh, I come back again to the financial system. One of the most striking features of the financial crisis and all the regulation that was subsequently decided on, uh, particularly if you look at Dodd-Frank, is that its net effect, because it was so complicated, was to raise the barriers to entry even higher and reduce the number of banks in the United States really quite significantly. So I think we should all be skeptical about uh, the idea that uh, this is a problem, therefore we must regulate it, because history is strongly inclined to suggest that, that there will be unintended consequences. And empowering the central government is is not a great solution to the kinds of problems that we face today. I wrote a book about this called The Great Degeneration, making the point that the regulatory state, sometimes called the administrative state, had become dysfunctional in the United States to the extent that it was really getting the heart to, to be innovative other than in the tech sector. Remember, the tech sector was the exception, the unregulated part of the economy, or very lightly regulated part of the economy. If you were working in healthcare, uh, or energy, if you're working in farming, most of the rest of the economy is highly regulated. And the Obama presidency was characterized by rapid growth uh, of regulatory powers, making it really, really frustrating to work in those sectors. This was something people in Silicon Valley didn't really experience. And I think that explains why there's a certain naivety in these part, parts of, of the country about regulation. Um, uh, so so the, the, I think the context here is that my, the focus of my nonprofit in the last two and a half years has been exactly on these issues. Um, and so, and I, I don't want, I think I want to, we can try to avoid getting to the wonky details, but um, relevant to people here, how do you run a tech startup that has user generated content where people can post things without section 230? It's, um, and, um, and how does the First Amendment actually address the problems that you put on the first slide with um, polarization, false news, and things like that. Um, so those are those are my that, those are my one question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I think there there's uh, a, a, an obvious <laughs> problem. Section two hundred and thirty has its passionate adherents who will tell you that if you get rid of it, uh, innovation will simply cease. I'm sorry. Uh, can we do? Yeah, what is 2.30? So this goes all the way back to the mid-1990s and what was at one time the Communications Decency Act, Telecommunications Act, sort of dominant piece of legislation in the space. And, and Section 2.30 basically said uh, that you, if you were a tech platform, wouldn't be liable for third-party content that you hosted. Uh, and this was uh, based on the insight that uh, if you wanted the internet to grow rapidly, you didn't want people to be paralyzed with the fear of litigation uh, or destroyed by, by litigation. And I think you could argue that it worked really well, but it worked so well that we've, we've now created these monster companies that pretend they're not content publishers, even when they are. Uh, and, and this is, I think, where Section 230 is anachronistic, because the fiction that Facebook is just a tech company, you know, that, that it doesn't publish content, it's ludicrous. It's publishing vast amounts of content that dominates uh, uh, the, the, the publication business. 80% of people uh, who consume news consume it via either Facebook or Google. Uh, and so I think this is simply an anachronism. And I don't think that anybody who wants to make a good business in 2018 says, I know, why don't I set up a platform that hosts content? I mean, that space is definitely taken. Uh, and I'm not sure that uh, in any case, uh, you, you would, even if you left Section 230 in place, you would get very far when you are already these dominant platforms. So I think that if one's asking the question, how do we, given that I don't believe self-regulation is going to work, and I think that's an important point to make clear. I don't buy the promises that have been made over the past year or so. Oh, we need to fix it, we need to do all these wonderful things. I think self-regulation is, is, is phony. You've got to create some incentives, uh, but they can't be too strong. In other words, 
if you take Section 230 away and do nothing else, then I think there is a problem. But if you simultaneously take, take, take Section 230 away and say, oh, but the First Amendment applies, then most things are protected by the First Amendment, except explicit threats of violence to individuals. Hate speech is mostly protected by the First Amendment. So you're not, as it were, going to uh, stop people from saying vile things. You'll only really stop them from saying uh, things that are harmful, demonstrably harmful uh, to individuals and demonstrable in a way that you could show in a court of law. So I don't think that you're going to suddenly make everybody polite and civil this way. But you will at least create some important incentives for these dominant network platforms. Uh, incentive number one, to make sure that that which is really toxic uh, does not appear. And at the moment, we do that pretty successfully with paedophilia and terrorism. That's it. Um, there's still an awful lot that appears that is, I think, clearly harmful to people and could be shown to be harmful in the courts. But I think we need to get away from the idea, which the Europeans have been encouraging, that it would be very good if Google and Facebook did censorship for them. Uh, and that's what I'm extremely sceptical about. The notion that, which is central to what the Germans would like to do, that the tech companies should just be fined if hate speech, whatever the hell that means, appears uh, on their platforms. Hate speech is what used to be called blasphemy or heresy. Uh, back in the, in the 16th and 17th century. And I'm very hostile to the use of the increasingly elastic use of that term to try to exclude certain kinds of argument from the public sphere. I'm not sure I necessarily solve the problem of your, of your startup, but a startup that's trying to compete with Google and Facebook is probably uh, in the wrong business. Um, yeah, uh, so th to my eternal shame, and only for a, for a brief uh, a brief period of time, I entertained the, the notion that perhaps the moon landing was a fake. Um, I was younger; the internet was yes less uh, ubiquitous. Um, but it strikes me now that what you're talking about is very much a top-down approach. What about the bottom-up approach, where you have these network groups? For example, if if somebody were now to believe the moon landing was a fake or that the world was flat. Back in the day, you'd be disavowed of that pretty quickly because your peers would make fun of you and you'd have to improve your argument. Now, I can go online, flat earth society, there's two million people who agree with me and I'm, I'm, I'm in a great echo chamber. So from the bottom up effect, how do you think we would solve or mitigate those, the vocal minority? That's a great question. I, I mean, I think in the end, the way uh, the, the public sphere is at the moment, uh, you can find validation for almost any crazy view. Uh, and we now have, a, in the United States, an electorate of roughly half of whom subscribe to one or other conspiracy theory. Uh, so that's not about to go away any more than it was possible to throw a switch and stop people believing in witches. I think this comes back to the point I made to you earlier. You have to accept that social and cultural change is relatively slow, though it's probably much faster now than it was then. We do know that attitudes change very rapidly uh, in our time compared with the past. An obvious example is same-sex marriage, which went from being more or less inconceivable to being something that you had to be publicly in favour of or you were vilified. So we, we are capable of really quite rapid cultural change. Understanding how that cultural change happens is, is the challenge. Uh, when people talk about top-down and bottom-up, I think they are thinking about the world with the wrong paradigm. The right paradigm is the network. Uh, and, and, and the network is not something that is kind of up or down. Uh, it's, it's something which we can analyze the structure of. And if you look at the work of someone like Lajla Barabasi, uh, or to take a completely different example, Nicholas Christakis, work that I try to showcase in the Square of the Tower, we have a lot of brilliant people working on how social networks transmit ideas. And we therefore have quite a good handle on how a bad idea, or for that matter, a good idea, spreads. Uh, though we still, I think, have a lot to learn about it. I, I was really struck when I was researching the book by the fact that there's no good research on how the most extreme ideologies of the 20th century spread. I mean, how did Nazism go viral in Germany? And how did Bolshevism go viral in Russia? You would think those were pretty interesting questions, but 
as far as I can see, nobody's really tried to apply network science to those problems. So I think we are moving towards a better understanding of how ideas change. Uh, and there's an obvious uh, lesson here, uh, which you know, gets us into the space of, of behavioral psychology. Uh, if you want an idea to spread, you have to understand the structure of the social network you want it to spread through. And you have to make sure, this is Christakis's work, that the right people, the people with high between the centrality, get your idea. So if you really want to persuade people that their kids should be vaccinated, then it's a good idea to understand the social network of the, of the, of the community that you're trying to persuade. Uh, we're engaged in a kind of anarchic, Hobbesian, uh, or you know, pre-Leviathan culture war. It's a war of all against all. It's Hobbes' state of nature. Uh, in the period after 1648, I think uh, what one saw was a, a certain stabilization uh, of the, the battles. Uh, ultimately, they, they formed the liberal and conservative uh, constellations that dominated European politics for most of the 19th century. And I, I think we're going to gradually see that crazy graph of the culture war I showed you change into something that I'd like to think of as science v. anti-science. Uh, and I think you just have to choose at some point. Are you, are you with science? Or are you with anti-science? There's a lot of anti-science around, and it's not just uh, you know amongst the uneducated. Highly educated people in humanities departments cling to all kinds of wildly unscientific ideas. Uh, they probably some at SOAS. Um, <laughs> highly unscientific ideas uh, of the sort that Marx had. All. So I think you know if you cite with science and you think of yourself as on the side of science. Uh, we can gradually corral all the crazies into just a kind of large anti-science cluster uh, and then uh, you know, defeat them, which liberalism ultimately did. I mean, liberalism won uh, in the end. Most people by the late 19th century have basically come out to liberalism. And I think we can do the same with science. I'm an optimist about that. First of all, I just wanted to say thanks so much for, for coming out and, and speaking with us. It's really interesting. Um, I, I want to go back to the, the antitrust point just for a bit, because one thing that I've wondered is whether or not there are inherent problems in the way that networks like Facebook are constructed. The, the way that I always kind of understood things was that Facebook effectively took the social networks that were present within our lives, put them online, but then also made it possible for advertisers to kind of establish, almost if we think about if we had back roads connecting cities, now we have a toll road that people have to pay for, but it's advertisers that get to, to be a part of that content. And so it's kind of like the system was designed to make it possible for external actors to programmatically inject content or ideas into what people are seeing from their friends, from people they trust. And so that just raises the question of whether or not there are inherent problems in those networks existing as they are that make it hard to establish those sort of, of, of changes. So if Facebook wanted to say, you know, both respect First Amendment views, but also customize, but also somehow reduce the prevalence of content that's corrosive, that kind of undermines the First Amendment case. And so, so my question, it, it seems, um, for, for context sake, I'm, I'm quite young. Uh, and, uh, and, and the solution that it seems like a lot of my friends have, sent, have, have just concluded is that the solution is get social media out of our lives so that services that are paid information services can come in. Do you think it's necessary to push those networks out of our lives or do you believe that those networks just are as they are and they are gonna become the standard and, and that we, we just ought to I don't know if that's clear. I, I think it's a great question. I, I derive considerable hope from the behavior of your generation. Um, <laughs> I, find, I find the... the, the, the when I, I just want to let you know that Phil would be considered Gen Z. I don't think Gen Z. I, I don't know. <laughs> struggle with the nomenclature here because sometimes it's called iGen, you know, the generation that didn't remember a time before the iPhone. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so much younger than me that uh, you're kind of younger than some of my children. That's a good definition. <laughs> really young. Um, I, I see data of, of, of young uh, users defecting from Facebook, uh, changing their behaviors. I'm very encouraged by those signs, although I worry that, uh, you know, 
leaving Facebook for Instagram is, is really a classic <laughs> illustration of out of the frying pan into the fire. Uh, but, but I think there's, there's a sign here of uh, what we discussed earlier, of, you know, of, of social cultural change. Change is often a generational thing. Uh, and as Facebook ages, uh, it becomes uncool. And we're saved in many times, not always, but we're saved usually by the, 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 the desire of youth to be cool. Uh, and the desire of youth to be cool and not to dress like your parents or listen to their music or do what they do. I mean, it just propels, uh, it propels change, not always in a good direction. The young can get things very wrong. Uh, I want to stress, historically, the young have a very mixed track record. Uh, see the Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, but uh, what I think we see here is a disillusionment with, uh, with the propaganda of, of, uh, of Silicon Valley. And the report that you alluded to that showed people were more re ready to pay for content gave great hope to those of us who uh, would like to get paid for content, um, live in hope of that. So it's, it's not entirely a bleak prospect. I, I think in truth that the, the great original sin of network platforms was the, the business model that said let's sell ads. And as soon as that decision was taken, uh, I think the whole project was doomed to lead to 2016. Uh, because, and I'm really struck by this, they knew that they were creating addictive apps. They consciously did that. They knew that it was all about engagement and it didn't really matter as long as you got engagement. And I think there was a, a, an unscrupulousness and almost amorality about the way that that was done. Um, so one thing I just wanted to say, I feel like you're underestimating potentially like the ramifications of scrapping 230 because you said, oh, if you're in the content business, but we have Medium. I, I only use Facebook, but I'm always surprised at how so apparently we need Instagram, Twitter, uh, Tumblr, uh, Medium. There's always a new form of content putting out there. So I think saying that like, oh, well, we now know, don't need this, I think might be a little premature. But I, I feel like I haven't heard from you exactly you say harmful, you use the word harmful a bunch of times, and you said, well, we already don't allow pedophilia and terrorism stuff on there. But then you also just admitted this last time around, uh, this last question, that much of the stuff was true. 99% of it was true, but it was still harmful, right? It was just someone amplifying the one immigrant killer in the neighborhood as opposed to am amplifying the statistics, right? So I guess my, my question is, Trump, if Trump didn't get elected because of fake news or because of the Russians, actually got elected because he was putting out true content out there and just dividing people, how would any of scrapping 230, imposing more First Amendment obligations, et cetera, solve that the actual problem? It seems like you said it would just be a rounding error. Well, I think it depends what you're trying to solve. I can't guarantee that the Democrats will always win presidential elections. Um, <laughs> that, and I don't think that should be the objective uh, that, that we aim for. Uh, first, let me take the, the, the point about content. Um, a medium sets out to be a content publisher. Yeah. Uh, I'm fine with that. I mean, I think there's a long tradition of publishing. Yeah. Yeah. Why would it? Because it Snapchat might, right? I mean, Snapchat, like it's instant stuff being sent. What if it's vulgar or, or child pornography being sent over? Yeah. In the case of medium, which is publishing long form essays, I don't see how Section 230 is vital to its existence uh, at all. I mean, indeed, if you remember this, you've got to combine this with the First Amendment. So, which is a great protection. It's pretty hard to actually uh, uh, fall foul of, uh, of legal action if you have the First Amendment on your side. I know this because, you know, terrible things have been published about my wife and you can't take legal action uh, even when they're, you know, manifestly false and defamatory. So it's a very powerful combination I'm offering you here. Uh, what will happen if you have the two uh, is that uh, the medium won't be able to publish articles that say, you know, that, that call for the, the, the death of specific individuals. They won't, you won't be able to publish an article that leads to somebody suffering date rape. But doesn't Facebook censor that already, right? Like, I think like when there's a death threat on Facebook, that gets censored. That, like most of these things that... Well, that has, that, you know, that has, that, that, that's not being censored, uh, you know, for any other reason, I think, than the community standards. The question here is what, why can't we simply allow a body of law that goes back hundreds or so years that determines what is illegal hate speech, specifically harmful speech, 
and what protects what might be offensive speech but isn't actually harmful. There's a there's a body of law there that should, that really is on the side of of genuine content publishers because it it allows your right to say things that may be outrageous, uh, but but you can't say things that are in effect murderous or are going to lead to physical harm. And that, that body of law is kind, kind of inert with respect to the internet because of Section 230. Well, so I, but I guess, I guess my point is like, right, if there's already good community standards, and I hate to sound like even the more conservative voice in this debate here about self-regulation, right? Everyone always talks about the that people want self-regulation. Right, right. And they're subject to arbitrary change, and they can become ever more restrictive, and indeed they are becoming restrictive. So I don't think it's a good idea to let uh, free speech on the internet be decided by the community standards of companies whose principal objective is to sell ads. That doesn't seem like a good outcome at all for the public sphere. Better to say it's the public sphere, which by the way, a Supreme Court ruling has already said, uh, it's been described as the public square. Uh, and I think as such, we, we have a terrific body of law. I mean, the common law is a wonderful thing. A terrific body of law which, which says what is good and acceptable speech. Most stuff, actually. Uh, uh, but also determines what you really shouldn't say in, in the public sphere. Let's push, push back once more. Sorry, like, but I guess my, my point here is that if already, let's say, Facebook has decent community standards, no child pornography, no terrorism, there are like no death threats, anything like that. And what basically swayed this election, which is what we're talking about, is the true stuff that was just framed in a bad way. I'm not understanding how this solves the problem that we were talking about of this polarization. If I don't see the, the change in legislation changing any of the, the, the bad stuff that caused all this stuff. Well, I think one thing that, that's been missed out here, uh, I'm slightly misrepresenting my argument, it's not that the true stuff was uh, decisive. Uh, a lot of political advertising was injected into the uh, Facebook uh, and news without being identified as such. I mean, that, that's one of the reasons that the voter suppression strategy was so successful, that they were able to target the precise demographics that they wanted not to show up to Hillary Clinton and bombard them with content that was designed to demoralize and discourage them from voting. And none of that content said paid for by uh, the Republican Party, even though it was or paid, paid for by the Trump campaign. Uh, you know, it's a complex story because one of the problems with the endless repetition of fake news as a meme is that we forget that the most damaging news was the true news uh, that had been obtained by the hacking of the email servers. Now, because mainstream news outlets carried the content that had come to them via Wikipedia, and because mainstream news outlets repeatedly legitimized the publication of confidential emails that had been hacked, it's, it's a much more complicated story than fake news. It was illicitly obtained true content that was really damaging for them. Uh, so, I, you know, I think when we come to, to write the history of 2016, and people will be doing this many, many years from now, there's going to be a very big challenge methodologically it will be a challenge to find out what was going on inside what was once your company. It's going to be a challenge to know what people saw because each individual was getting their own customized version of the campaign advertising tailored to their specific uh, tastes. Uh, it wasn't like any previous election where you could sort of say what the campaign ads were that everybody saw. This is going to be a really hard history to write. Uh, but if we don't if we can't conclude now that, there was, that something was really broken with the, the way that the public sphere operated in 2016, uh, if only because it was being hacked by enemy uh, powers, but I think more importantly because there was a huge amount of political content uh, that was either uh, untrue or malicious or, uh, or misleading, and it was being injected into our public sphere um, through essentially ad sales, uh, I mean, that surely can't be a good basis for running a democracy. And the reason I wrote what is to be done, I haven't even described the title to say, look, this is really a terrible way of, of running, uh, of, of running a, a, a democracy. We need to, to figure out how to fix it. Uh, we're about to have elections again uh, in just a matter of days. Hardly anything's actually changed in the way our public sphere works. There's been a couple of pieces of legislation passed. Uh, it'd be harder to, to, to 
do political advertising without it's being identifiable. But I, I hate to say it, but it, it's really not that different a system from the one that we had in November 2016. And that, that's a concern for me. I don't pretend to have all the answers. I think this is actually the early phase of the debate. I've really enjoyed having the debate with you uh, this evening. One reason I came here tonight, um, once again, giving my content away for free, is that <laughs> we're, we're not going to figure this out as individuals sitting in ivory towers. Uh, the thing I've learned from the book, and this is the last thing I'll say, is uh, that, that networks actually are terrifically powerful, creative structures. And the best ideas in history haven't come from lone geniuses. They've come from networks of, of smart people speaking frankly, being able to speak frankly, not feeling that they'll be denounced or exposed on social media for what they've said. That was what they got right in late 18th century Europe and the Enlightenment. Uh, that's where I stand. I'm, I'm with the Enlightenment. And I think the Enlightenment is going to be the best source of, of a method for solving the problems that we have. With that, we thank you very much. Thank you.